Good evening, Los Angeles. I hope this evening finds you and your family as well as can be in what has been the toughest year of our lives. These moments that we march through, these briefings that I get to present to you, I treasure. While I wish I wasn't here having to inform you about the good news and the bad news to lay out the tragedy and the triumph of every day and every week, I am filled with the strength of knowing that each one of you is doing your part in this historic moment to get our Los Angeles and more importantly, our beloved Angelinos through this crisis together. Tonight, I want to focus on steps that we are taking as a city to vaccinate all Angelinos and to help those who are struggling as we put this pandemic to an end once and for all. This week, we are delivering more vaccines more quickly at more locations. But the vaccine news is, quite frankly, both good and bad. The good news is, as of today, the city of Los Angeles has administered 293,252 vaccine doses at our five city vaccination sites, serving both city of LA and LA County residents. We're averaging about 13,051 daily vaccinations at our sites this week, a 27% increase since last week. And get this number, one I'm very proud of. We have distributed 98% of all doses of vaccines that we have been given. That's right, 98%. That's a number I've pushed our people very hard, to not sit on vaccines, to not waste a single dose, and to make sure that we are doing everything we can to get that day where something new opens, that day where the economy comes back, that day when we can hold a loved one that much closer. The problem is, and here's the bad news, we don't have enough vaccines. All of the numbers and the successes we've had so far point to a simple fact. When vaccines do get to Los Angeles, we know how to administer them. We have a great infrastructure set up of amazing people, and we will give them to folks efficiently and safely. But the problem is we still aren't receiving enough doses soon enough. That's not just something for the city of LA. I know across this county, other cities, the county of Los Angeles itself, states in our nation, let alone nations around the world simply don't have enough vaccine to meet the supply. We're vaccinating people faster than new vials are arriving here in Los Angeles. And I'm very concerned right now. I'm concerned as your mayor that our vaccine supply is uneven, it's unpredictable, and too often inequitable. By tomorrow, the city will have exhausted its current supply of the Moderna vaccine for first dose appointments. This is an enormous hurdle in our race to vaccinate Angelinos. And unfortunately, it means that we will have to temporarily close Dodger Stadium and the other four non-mobile vaccination sites for two days on Friday and Saturday. This is not where I want to be. It's not where we deserve to be. And we have firefighters, we have workers from CORE, we have clinicians ready to draw vaccines, ready to give vaccines, ready to welcome traffic in and out by car, by foot into our centers. But we won't have those vaccines because the supply isn't there. As soon as we receive more supply, and I hope that we get, I'd love a call tonight or tomorrow from some source at the state or the national level saying we found some more, but most likely, hopefully Tuesday or Wednesday, we will reopen and start the business up again. And this will not affect those who are waiting for a second dose, but it will prevent us from moving forward with new first doses until we get more vaccines. Even as we've heard good news at the national level from our new administration of new numbers overall for our country, moving from 8 million a day up to more than 11 million uh, vaccines, for some reason, it hasn't yet reached us. So these closures, unfortunately, are inevitable. Let me give you the numbers. This week, we only received 16,000 new doses. 16,000. That's about the number of doses we give out every single day. So our week's supply is only one day's supply. Thankfully, we're rolling things over. We're able to keep today and tomorrow open. But that is down 90,000 from the week before and 29,000 from the week before that. As I said, 16,000 doses is what we burn through on an average day. 
and now we've re received that for an entire week. That is unacceptable. I'm not here to point fingers. I'm here, as always, to be a partner. But I want to be clear, Los Angeles needs more doses. In fact, in a briefing from our county partners this morning, we learned that other cities with smaller populations are receiving more doses than our entire county with a larger population. When we look to places that have lower cases, we see 50% more doses going to other cities. I don't want to take a single dose away from them, but it is only fair that Los Angeles gets a steady supply to meet the moment of our need. I love hearing announcements that we are expanding also the number of places where you can get vaccinated. But let me be clear, these shouldn't come at the expense of fully supplying the existing facilities that the county and the city has, our megapods, our community clinics, our mobile clinics, facilities like Dodger Stadium that already have the capacity in place without having to get one more cone or one more person there. The infrastructure is in place and we have the capacity not only to meet what we've been doing but to surpass and ramp up there, our capacity. The good news is this. To anybody who gives us the supply, we will get the job done. Let me repeat that. Give us more doses and we will get them into arms as quickly as our 98% success rate shows. In fact, if you give us the supply, we have worked and done the calculations. The city of LA sites alone can complete 5 million vaccinations by July. That's essentially the number that we've been tasked with to meet the need of our population here. Think about that. You give us the supply, we'll meet the need by July. That is something we should all aspire to and that we all can do together. I understand that early on there's kinks in the supply chain and we can tolerate them, but I will never be quiet when it comes to advocating for you to get your first dose and your second dose, to expand who qualifies by age and geography and job for vaccinations. And we've done our part to get that infrastructure up and running. And I'm glad that Los Angeles County Department of Public Health announced today that they will expand the list of residents who are eligible to be vaccinated in about two weeks, including our teachers and our school workers in education and childcare, food and agriculture, and emergency service and law enforcement, which they've also said they've applied to the state to include our transportation workers. And speaking of Metro Chair, I want our Metro bus operators and train operators and folks on the front lines to know we are fighting for vaccines for you too. But we can only get those new groups vaccinated, not to sound like a broken record, if we get the supply in. We just need more vaccines. And getting vaccines into more arms will help us reduce the cases, the hospitalizations, and the deaths. Today the, hosp sorry, today, the county reported 3,434 new cases. It's not a low number, but it's dramatically down from our peak, where we saw five or six times more cases. But we had 141 new deaths, a number we can never normalize, a number we can never tolerate until that number is zero. And hospitalizations, thankfully, are down to 3,722, the lowest number in months, but still a treacherous number for any family who has a loved one hanging on right now. All data points are trending in the right direction, but I need you to stay vigilant. Even as we wait for more doses, we haven't stopped building out our system to get those shots into more arms because vaccinations are our way out of this pandemic, and we have to make sure that no Angelino gets left behind. When I heard the statistic that just 3.5% of doses countywide have gone into the arms of black Angelinos living in LA County, we all could see that number is unacceptable for all of us. And last week I said we were jumping in action to change that, just as we did with testing in communities of color and our lower income communities at the beginning of this pandemic. So last, last week we launched a pilot program to help us meet that mission by bringing mobile vaccines to where people live, the communities that aren't being vaccinated enough at our mega sites and other places, working with partners and trusted community members, senior centers and community-based organizations, council members, to make sure that shots are accessible and available where you live through organizations you already know. And the good news is it's working. 
In the first week of mobile vaccinations, we administered over 1,700 shots, over two-thirds of which, which went to black Angelinos, and over 90% to Angelinos of color, living in some of our most impoverished, densest communities that are most transportation poor. And tonight, I can announce that we've doubled that capacity this week, expanding the program into Council District 9. And next week, we will triple that when we add our third mobile unit to the east side and northeast in Council District 14. Even with fewer vaccines and having to shut down Dodger Stadium, we will keep those going this week because we can't afford to see the outbreaks and, quite frankly, the unequal deaths that we're seeing in communities of color. In the early days of testing, I said to our most vulnerable neighbors, we will come to you, and now we're doing the same thing with vaccines. I'm grateful to my colleagues, to Council Members Marquise Harris-Dawson, to Kern Price, to Kevin DeLeon, to our Council leadership with Nuri Martinez, and everyone for their leadership in this effort, especially that of the Los Angeles Fire Department. And I want to thank all the City Council staff and area representatives in my Office of Public Engagement who are on the front lines of these efforts, themselves in harm's way, making sure that vaccines get to all Angelinos. And I want to take a moment, as I always do, to speak to those communities when it comes to COVID-19 vaccines. Those of us who come from communities that are African American, Latino, have good reason to be skeptical given the history of this country the experiments that were done on some of our ancestors, and the way that we've been treated by an unequal healthcare system. Too often, the back has been turned on us by a medical establishment that has provided a legacy that is a cancer on our body politic. And some folks may feel wary about vaccines, but we can't die disproportionately. Don't let this, vac sorry, this virus win and take our loved ones disproportionately. So when it comes up or when somebody offers you the ability or we bring one of these mobile vans to your area, get your vaccine. This is the way that we save our people. Vaccinations are the key to ending this pandemic. But even when COVID-19 is finally behind us, we still need to address a crisis I've been focused on before and will be afterwards, but that right now we must confront too, that of too many unhoused Angelinos. Last month, we learned that the federal government finally answered a call I gave three or four years ago for a FEMA-level response to homelessness. And I want to thank again President Biden, Vice President Harris, our Congress, and all the workers at FEMA who are now providing 100 percent reimbursement to house people at great risk who are unhoused but could get COVID-19, a program that has been known here as Project Room Key, together with our governor, Gavin Newsom and with our state legislature has already brought more than 2,000 people above and beyond our normal programs in the city and 4,000 countywide indoors with meals, with safety, with a warm place to be protected from the elements and off the streets. When the news came through now that 100 percent of this reimbursement would be provided, I asked my team to jump into action to work with the joint City-County Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority to develop a plan to bring hundreds of more homeless Angelinos indoors right now. And just a few hours ago, I signed an executive authority as mayor to make that plan a reality, together with our City Council, I met today with our Council President Nuri Martinez, to authorize upfront funding to extend our city leases on multiple Project Room Key hotels through September 30th. LASA and service provider staff will continue to work tirelessly to get our current hotel guests into permanent housing, to move new guests into those rooms, and to take every single empty room in those hotels and fill them as soon as possible. Tomorrow, we will begin those efforts right away to fill 300 empty rooms, to move hundreds of others in the coming weeks out into housing, and to replace them with others from the street. And I've instructed LASA to set aside half of these rooms for people who have been living on Skid Row. Working with the Downtown Women's Center, with Council District 14 and Kevin DeLeon, with local advocates, LASA will also prioritize immediate placements for qualifying black women who have been especially hard hit, seniors who are experiencing homelessness, who are especially vulnerable, and those who have been living in homeless communities in Echo Park that I know Councilmember O'Farrell has been working to house.
This is a crisis that calls on all of us to think and to be big, to use every ounce of our creativity and our energy and our hearts to get souls off the street and to put our neighbors on the path to a permanently better future. Just as we never lost sight of the plight of our unhoused neighbors in this pandemic, we have stayed focused on ensuring also that nobody has to choose between working to pay their bills and quarantining to stop the spread of COVID-19. And that's why, at the beginning of this pandemic, the city established a supplemental paid leave policy for employees of large businesses and nonprofits who had been, re had been working at their employers prior to February 3rd, 2020. The policy allowed these employees two weeks of paid time off to prevent the spread of COVID-19 or to assist a relative who was infected or who was elderly. And today I'm updating that emergency order to extend this benefit to employees who have been working for at least 60 days at large businesses or nonprofits, companies or nonprofits with more than 500 employees in the city or more than 2,000 um, employees nationwide. I urge at the same time Congress to renew the federal paid leave policy that expired at the end of last year for employees of businesses with between 50 and 500 employees, because they count too, and to get this critical relief to working families nationwide right now. Please visit wagesla.lacity.org for more information. After a dark and painful year, my friends, there is light. Signs of light all around us. The data continues to point in the right direction. We heard the county say we may hit a threshold just this week or early next week of over 25, under 2,500 cases a day. We've seen new cases drop by 31% over just the last week alone and hospitalizations by more than a quarter in a single week. But I also want to be clear the threat of this virus has not gone away even with every vaccine that saves a life. We need to continue moving forward. Every death is one death too high. We are still losing too many people. I know that from conversations I have every week with families of the fallen. Variants continue to spread, complicating our recovery and making it more important than ever to keep protecting ourselves, our families, by the behavior that we engage in. And yet we have the tools to keep safe, to keep our families healthy, continue to mask up. The CDC now recommends that wearing two masks, a simple measure that could prevent more than 95% of transmission, or make sure it's one with a tight seal. And keep your distance and hold off on gatherings. Remember that air and ventilation lowers COVID risks substantially. We're getting there, Los Angeles, and we will get there. I'll fight through these moments where we need more vaccines. I'll make sure that they're going to the people who need them and that no community is overlooked. We won't forget those who are struggling financially. And most importantly, we will come together, not to point fingers or to say what divides us, but to feel and to act on that that unites us. So keep the faith. There's hope on the horizon. And keep up your extraordinary work and stay healthy and stay safe. And whenever you can, stay at home, sending you all strength and love from my family to yours. Thank you, and with that, I'm happy to answer questions. First question, please. First question is from Ben Oreskes from LA Times. Please go ahead. Hey, Ben, how are you? Hey, Mayor Garcetti, thanks for taking my question. Um, just off the news about Project Room Key, you know you've spoken of a FEMA-like response and thinking big. I, I wonder, uh, we're hearing about the program sort of continuing at the level it is, but many activists and members of the city council have called for it to expand uh, exponentially because of this uh, reimbursement scheme. How big would you like to see the program go, um, and what are you going to be doing to sort of make that happen? Absolutely. So, so Ben, I'm, I'm a little wary from uh, last year when we had one number, for instance, with our rec and parks facilities only to learn we had to space them twice as much. So I always am very careful at not uh, overestimating. We're looking at hundreds already. I think we can get to a goal together with the city and the county of at least a couple thousand. Um, that is realistic. And I won't turn down a single hotel that wants to do this. So we believe we can find the reimbursable cash flow 
we need to find dollars. By the way, FEMA paying for it doesn't mean that a hotel doesn't need to get paid right away, but we figured out a way to do that. We have a hotel, at least one, that we think would be a new one that hopefully we can announce in the coming weeks. Um, we're actively looking at others, and the county, I know, is negotiating with at least a handful of ones inside the city of LA, let alone what may be outside the city of LA. So I would just reiterate what I said, go big. Um, I don't think you can just say exponential without um, you know, getting into the details and finding the number of hotels that are willing. Uh, some hotels that had turned us down, one now looks like it may say yes. Uh, other ones had unused beds. That's the best place to start if you already have a hotel. And the ones that we're going to wind down, keeping them going, um, of course, with the turnover rate, is more than just a couple hundred beds. That's two to 400 to 600, uh, the longer we can keep this going. And my message isn't just about what we can do. I would say very powerfully to our federal partners, who I've spoken to the White House about this program, both Project Room Key and Home Key, which they're excited to look at uh, to influence and impact national policy as well is help us keep this going beyond the pandemic as well. And if you do that, we will make real dents in homelessness. So there is nothing that we will turn down. Um, I, don't, I can't put a number on that until we continue to see, but I know that county workers, certainly anybody on my staff, I'd encourage council staff and others, if you want to go big, find those hotels, bring them to us, and we can get 100% reimbursement. So let's not have a limit. Let's figure out how many we can get. Thanks, Ben. Any follow-up? Um, yeah, just really quickly, I, I, I wonder for you um, what you see as the biggest stopping or uh, stumbling blocks. Uh, what, is it about ho going for smaller hotels? Where, where do you feel like the county or the city should focus? Should we be going for hotels with less than 100 beds? No, I think you should do both. Obviously, it's easier when you find, uh, it's usually cheaper and easier when you find a bigger hotel because you can get some economy of scale. But I wouldn't turn down the smallest of hotels. I think anybody who's willing to do this, that's a hotel or motel, we should look at, full stop. Now, the barriers that you ask for, that doesn't mean there's unlimited capacity from service providers out there. That's not something the city does, but I know LASA and others need service providers to be able to administer the meals, check in on people, et cetera. Um, we want to make sure that we aren't just housing people in hotels without somebody who can case manage them and help them get to permanent housing, because the hotel isn't the solution. The hotel is a place to be safe while we work on the solution with them. And I'm proud that between 2 and 4 percent of the exits from Project Room Key have gone back to the street. So between 96 and 98 percent have not gone back to the street without uh, some sort of solution. That's a pretty amazing statistic. And I know some people have focused on how many get into permanent supportive housing. There's a lot of different places you can land in housing. Once we have people in there, we can talk to them. So that's another barrier, too. I don't think we've hit that barrier yet, but it's not an infinite amount because we need to have service providers there. But I met with LASA today, and I said, ramp up as much as you can, talk to our service providers, let's find out what their, their capacity in the um, biggest stretch would look like, and let's see if we can try to gun for that. Thanks, Thank ben. you. Next question, please. Next question, please. Next question is from Albert Zerna from Boyle Heights Beat. Please go ahead. Hey, Oliver, how you doing? I'm good. How are you, Mr. Mayor? Good. Hanging in there. Thank, thank, thank you for you. taking my question. Um, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned uh, mobile vaccination. Uh, is there a plan currently to send any to uh, Boyle Heights and East LA area? Yeah. And then I wanted to ask, um, you also mentioned inequity in uh, getting vaccines rolled out. Currently, 69% uh, of residents in Boyle Heights don't qualify for vaccination, but it's one of the hardest hit areas um, in Los Angeles. It has some of the highest numbers so far during the pandemic. Have you spoken with uh, the Department of Public Health uh, to prioritize people in Boyle Heights and similarly impacted areas to get uh, people who aren't 65 and older vaccinated to kind of slow that yeah, spread? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so the tripling of our capacity will be a uh, mobile um, team that is going to be in Council District 14, which includes Boyle Heights. So yes, the short answer is won't it be exclusively for Boyle Heights, but it will include Boyle Heights. So we'll work together with Council Member De Leon, uh, with stakeholders, and make sure that it gets and serves people in Boyle Heights because it is has been one of the highest hit neighborhoods uh, anywhere. Um, secondly, I've stated before, but I'm not legally permitted to do by geography. But I would love the freedom to go by geography and zip code as much as by age or profession. I think that would be a good public health way 
to make sure that wherever there's hot spots, we're surging vaccines into those areas to collectively bring that down, which serves the whole city from spread. So um, I have spoken with state officials. It's not the county that can do that. It's a state and, uh, um, and federal, really, tiering that doesn't allow that yet. But if in a couple weeks there are some allowable or permissible ways to do that, I absolutely would look at reserving vaccines for some of our hardest hit zip codes and surging them in to folks who don't necessarily fit into the 65 and over or healthcare worker or whatever is available. I'm very supportive of that. One last thing, the Cal State LA site uh, that's in the city of LA but adjacent to City Terrace um, that the federal government and the state is looking at opening next week. Um, I hope again there's supply for all of us. Um, they did say they wanted to and they came out to study our mobile um, uh, our mobile teams and that they were going to attach, I think, at least two. So that may be two other mobile teams together with ours that could uh, work in the area of the kind of east side and northeast Los Angeles, which is good news for all of us. Thanks, Oliver. Next question. Next question, please. Patrick Healy, NBC4. Your line is open. Patrick Healy, how you been? Hi, Mr. Mayor. Good evening to you. You too. Um, wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on what you think happened that, that put the city in this whiplash position of, of going from trying to persuade people, look, we're not the county, you can still get first doses, to now all of a sudden your allotment has been slashed. And uh, what your expectation is when the state switches to the centralized system next week, how that will affect Los Angeles's position? Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. You really get to the core of some very important issues. I'll try to address them and I'll try to do it as economically as possible because they're complicated but really critical. Um, I hope that no new system, whether it's the state coming in with um, Blue Shield, um, the federal administration coming in, I think everybody shares really great goals and um, everybody's working really hard. And so let me start by thanking all of our partners. Um, but it is tough on the receiving end as the ones who kind of do the logistics for things to change a lot of the time. And for us, we just need predictability. The simple answer to your first question is we're down to 16,000 we doses we were given for an entire week, and we usually do 16,000 doses an entire day. It doesn't mean we haven't asked. It doesn't mean the state isn't trying. Uh, but, you know, the federal government saying 11 million doses are going out there. There's something screwed up in the system. And I'm not pointing fingers. I'm here to help but I need everybody to help me too, so that we aren't put in that position of suddenly going dark on the biggest vaccination center in the world. Um, uh, this is one of the successes we've had. This is a place where we're surging more equity, figuring out ways to invite folks in the hardest hit communities with priority. Um, we had discussion today about transportation options for those who can't go through a drive through center, et cetera, and the walk-up centers that will also go dark because of these vaccines that have been in San Fernando Park, that have been at Lincoln Park, places that have been among the hardest hit, um, and South Los Angeles too. That, that is, I think, the short answer is that simply the supply isn't there. And I think it's going to be very, very critical for us to have a system that doesn't just keep opening more and more places up and saying, well, you each have less and less. Go to the places that are proven. Go to the places with good statistics like ours with 98% of the doses out and in people's arms already and reward them. Secondly, at the national level, go to those places with hotspots. There's no reason that there should be a city on the East Coast with 50% more doses per capita when our cases are at least 50% higher than theirs. We should be looking at this logically as a nation and making sure that there's equity. And then lastly, I would say to our federal and state partners, Something like Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles is bigger than almost half the states in this union. The county of Los Angeles is bigger than all the states but five. So what works maybe in a smaller state where the state does certain things and can very effectively get that out to everybody, I have deep sympathy for my state partners who are trying to figure out where are all the vaccines, why isn't everybody reporting them perfectly, why can't we get the sort of daily data that a much smaller state does, and maybe they can help us by treating us more like a state, giving us more direct supply ourselves, asking us for the data back, and holding us accountable. I'm not scared of that. In fact, I know that if we were 
getting much more of that direct access to vaccines from our uh, federal suppliers, for instance, we would make them proud, we would get them out, we would meet our equity goals, and we would get a lot more people vaccinated more quickly and open up our economy, our schools, and everything else uh, more rapidly as well. So that's my hope. That's what I'm working really hard on. Snapshot of today, the good news is we're getting them out. The bad news is we've got a kink in the supply. I'm confident in a week or two, we will get plenty of more supply in. But I want to know, not week to week, not day to day, I'd really love for us to be able to know a month or so out so we can plan for it, staff for it, have all the people, and make us all proud. Any follow-up, Patrick? Um, yeah, so I take it the timetable here is that it was just like in the last 24 hours that he learned that the allocation will be slashed this week? Yes, we, we learned, I mean, we... We always are every single night and every single day talking to our state partners, I mean, our county partners. They do heroic stuff, um, indebted to Dr. Ferrer, who reaches out and sometimes pulls back ones that we're going to other places to make sure we have enough for Dodger Stadium. Um, I'm indebted to our firefighters who found out 50 different Ralphs hadn't used all of their vaccines, so literally took ambulances and drove out there and picked up, I think, it, dozens of Ralphs doses that we could then take and use um, in those places. People are trying really hard, but those of us at the end of the line can't see down the line why this is so complicated and why it's so hit and miss. Um, but yes, we just found out about that. Um, I pushed my staff all day long to see what we could stretch out. Um, and I'm hoping that you know, there's some federal official out there, some state official who tonight got the good news that some more doses um, are on their way someplace and can tell us, hey, you don't have to go dark on Friday. You don't have to go dark on Saturday. Because uh, if we get that news tomorrow, we'll have that rocking and rolling at Dodger Stadium and the four other sites for the rest of the weekend. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, if I could, Mr. Merrick, yeah. I'd also be curious if you think the supply chain is becoming too fragmented, that there are these individual entities now with their, their uh, own supplies, and it's pitting all these entities against each other in competition for this limited resource. It is a little bit of Hunger Games out there, but I think um, w when I'm generous, the well-intentioned side of this is there are some amazing folks that can do things that mega center, megapods can't. Um, trusted community clinics. I love seeing them get more supply uh, because there's people who live in neighborhoods where maybe they don't want to go to a government-run center or they, they trust that place uh, down the street or they can walk to it more easily. That's good news. Uh, but we've also expanded to all sorts of others. We're, we're doing kind of an all-the-above approach which if our vaccine supply was increasing 50% each week would be fine. But I think part of this is we've gone to so many places without the supply matching that, that yes, you're seeing some of the core places, no pun intended, like um, ours and the county mega sites, not have as much supply. Um, and I think at a certain point, Everybody wants to come in and save the day, and I admire that. That means I'm working with partners who have the same motivation as me at the national, state, county level, and my, my city peers around me. Um, but it would be good for somebody to kind of take that 50,000-foot view, look at the metrics of the places like our sites that are knocking it out of the ballpark, that have efficient centers, where they're well-staffed up, that are getting 98% of the doses out, that have mobile clinics alongside that, where we have 90% people of color getting those doses, and reward us. That's my simple message. Reward those places that are working before we also build more architecture around doses that don't exist. Thanks, Patrick. Mr. Mayor, thank you much. You bet. Next question, please. Next question. Judah from KMX News Radio. Please go ahead. Hey, Claudia. How many questions tonight? Hi. Uh, hi. I'm sorry if I missed this earlier, but the feed dropped off, and so I missed some of it. And oh, so you may have touched on this. Did you say how much upfront funding is available for the project key expansion, and how many uh, more rooms that will be able to provide? Uh, also, if you can clarify on the vaccination site closures. You did say second doses are guaranteed, so when you say closed, does that just mean to first dose appointments, but the second dose appointments will continue? Um, and then I'm wondering how many people are not showing up for vaccination appointments, um, and do you think second dose appointments should be for six weeks, start doing more first dose shots, get some protection on people, especially given the threat that's posed by the new variant? Thank you. You got it. Let me see if I can remember all. We've got a great person who's writing them down to, in case I forget. So um, 
With a project room key, um, it's in the hundreds, comfortably 300 uh, that we have confirmed, as well as the extension of, of, I think, more than, let me see if I can get the numbers, I believe 600 that would have closed. Uh, so we're close to 1,000 and hopefully another hotel to announce soon. And that's just the baseline. If we get more, those numbers would climb. But um, I think I can um, conservatively say we're looking at about 1,000. Um, more rooms that would have either been closed and or new ones opening. Uh, second, um, when it comes to uh, the closures and second doses, no, we're closed for two days, but remember we are, we're using Moderna, so everybody's gonna be able to hit their second dose timing. Uh, we do anticipate more doses coming next week. We're told more will come, though we don't have an exact number and we feel comfortable. And the county has always said, we will guarantee you your supply for your second doses. So nothing has changed with that. It just means fewer first doses, but we are not, we are closed period for those two days right now, except for our mobile um, uh, sites, which we'll be doing new, um, uh, all first doses on those. Um, in terms of whether we should extend out beyond the 28 days or 21 days when it comes to Pfizer, look, if things don't get better in our country on the supply, that is something that is a legitimate question to ask. I personally have never opposed saying go to five or six weeks because the evidence shows it's still just as good and your first dose gives you oftentimes about 80% coverage. Um, I hope we never have to get to that point. I hope that we don't, uh, but I have never opposed that. But that's a call that then has to be made uh, at the county and state level um, so that it's not confusing to people where some people say is it three weeks is it four weeks is it six weeks it's already confusing enough that a Pfizer second dose is supposed to be three weeks later a Moderna one is supposed to be four weeks if that gets extended out but if things worst case scenario yeah I'm a big believer more first doses than just getting a second dose um, can protect more people uh, control the spread of the virus more and uh, luckily though we're not yet there any follow-on with any of that? Oh, sorry, the no-show rate, rate you said. It's usually about 10 to 12%, similar to what our testing rate was. For whatever reason, about 10 to 12% of people don't show up. But um, we, all, we build that in. We're kind of like a, an airline. We overbook, uh, knowing what our supply is so that we don't waste a single dose. And I know you didn't ask, but I, I do want to state for the record because I know there's some confusion out there. There were no doses wasted at Dodger Stadium yesterday. There were appointments that weren't taken but those get rolled into today and tomorrow. Uh, I wish there were more available because we'd be open on Friday and Saturday, but 100% of all the appointments for this week, 100% of all the doses for this week will be used and build on that 98% um, success rate. Next question, please. It's from Anna Scott from KCRW. Hey, Anna, how are you? Hey, Anna. Good, hi. Um, a project room key question. So. Um, so it's my understanding most of the people who have exited Project Room Key in recent months have just gone to other kinds of temporary housing. Um, there's not enough permanent housing resources for everyone who's gone through the program already. So um, what is the city going to do? Is there anything concrete you can say about what the city is going to do to get more people into permanent housing in the short and medium term, especially if you do take more people into Project Room Key? Yeah, of course. Oh, I think, Anna, you've done a wonderful job covering this, too. We all know how, how tight the supply of housing is. Um, the city can't um, wave a magic wand and, and have more apartments suddenly open up. But we're going to be doing a number of things, and some that I've already announced, but I'll restate. One is Project Home Key, 15 buildings that we've acquired that can be uh, more long-term and, in some cases, permanent housing solutions, uh, hundreds and hundreds of rooms that are part of that. Um, advocating at the federal level, uh, for more of that, and a discussion that I had in a, a plank in um, then candidate Biden's platform that has moved into the White House now of uh, uh, housing as a human right, a right to housing and expanding vouchers, uh, housing choice vouchers, formerly kind of known as Section 8, uh, to hopefully one day be universal entitlement, but in the meantime, a dramatic expansion as we saw with vouchers for veterans, which helped us reduce veterans homelessness by 80% and adjusting that to uh, existing rental levels. Um, we continue to also open up more and we'll see over a thousand new permanent supportive housing units open up this year. And for those who are the hardest to serve with the greatest uh, need, we are able to then move them into some of the permanent housing that now is accelerating and will provide 10,000 units. We'll be more than halfway to our 50% uh, goal 
um, five years into money flowing from HHH this coming year uh, or coming uh, this year and next year. So those are all parts of it. It's really tough work. I admire the housing navigators that do this. We're looking at, and if the um, project home key success is built on as proposed in the governor's budget, uh, the advocacy I've done in the last couple of weeks to at the national level, see if we can get HUD, Congress, and others to match some of that. I hope we can acquire more permanent buildings as well, whether they're former motels and hotels, whether they're apartment buildings and other spaces. We're also looking at um, you know, other creative ways. Um, we've opened up, you know, they're not permanent solutions always, but you know, the tiny home communities just toured the first one to open up in Council District 2 and Council Member Krikorian's district. Um, and so it is an all the above kind of approach. And to landlords, I want to say something, and I think we're going to um, do this more formally in maybe next week's briefing. We need your help, and we can guarantee you money. And we know a lot of landlords have some vacancies in a tough moment. And we want you to have a steady uh, rental supply. We want you to have great tenants and help us address a problem we all face, uh, that of our unhoused. So working with PATH, with United Way, we're going to continue to push that up so we get more supply for those housing navigators who are going to help people move from a motel to a housing solution. Any follow-up, Anna? Um, just one quick thing on home key, the 15 home key sites, are those all turning to permanent housing right away or are some of those going to be interim housing? Uh, they're a mix of both, I believe, but I'll, let me f uh, follow up and I can get you a project by project list, okay? Thank you, Anna. Okay, Next. Thanks. Next question. Next question, please. To Dakota Smith from the LA Times, please go ahead. Hey, Doug, how you doing? Was it? Good evening, Mayor. Oh, sorry. You I thought know, it was... you talked about... Um, oh, Dakota, project. sorry. Really? Sorry, Dakota, I thought I heard Doug. Go ahead. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you great. Go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, on the, on your, your comments about the FEMA response, obviously um, city officials, I think Mike Bonin was the first, have been calling for a FEMA-like response to the homeless crisis for um, years now. Um, given the rising number of unhoused people that are dying on the street now, is there any discussion between the city and the federal government where the federal government would come in and provide medical services, food, tents, a sort of emergency blanket response just to alleviate the immediate suffering that's going on in the streets. Um, I think that that was something that felt like it was a possibility last year when the Trump administration was talking about it. Um, if there isn't a discussion for something like that, is that something that you would want to see? Thank you. Uh, not that I've heard of, uh, but you'd have to ask the administration. They've never communicated that. And I think even with both the Trump administration and also with the Biden administration, the thinking has evolved that while that works for floods, that doesn't, that's not the response that works well for the unhoused. To spend a lot of money in putting people in a non-solution uh, is not the best use of money. That project room key and home key, uh, that helping uh, buildings to be acquired, figuring out ways to do things like um, our housing challenge has and some of our council members are doing from tiny home villages to other solutions, I think is where the uh, evolution of our uh, national policymakers uh, have been. Um, there's been a number of us who have called for this level of response, but FEMA doesn't mean, a FEMA level response doesn't mean copying what FEMA does on every emergency. Each one is different. And homelessness, if we're serious about it, what FEMA does is it takes care of people before and after a crisis hits them. And so why I was heartened to see this past year that finally we could house people before they got COVID-19. In other words, it's before the flood hits them. It's before the earthquake comes. It's before the fire was there that we were able to get people into shelter, thousands of them. And to me, that was a sea change, something that we advocated for a long time and something great. But we shouldn't replace the images of like what you see after uh, Katrina or something um, and getting mass shelter with the needs of very complicated human lives that deal with mental health issues and sometimes addiction issues uh, that deal with what we have to do that are the barriers in. So I'd rather see our, the federal government ask us what works best than to tell us and to surge folks they don't have the capacity, for instance, for enough medical workers and they're already dealing with COVID-19 everywhere to apply those in the way that Secretary Carson had implied could help uh, with shelters here. And I did speak with the um, Biden administration and they really are 
kind of a housing first philosophy um, administration and more will come out on this. But they do want to continue supporting those temporary solutions, but they think long term we should be investing much more in the more permanent solutions. That too is music to my ears because a FEMA level response for homelessness means helping us get people off the streets, not under tents, but into actual buildings, and then moving them into places that are longer term housing solutions. We don't always have to build those. That can often be done by connecting people with family, uh, cohabitating with other people who have experienced homelessness, sharing things like kitchens and common space for some folks who need that while others can be in other settings. So to me, it's really the urgency of a FEMA level response that now we're starting to see build, but we still got a long way for our federal government to go to meet that and to match that need. Thanks, Dakota. Any follow up? No, no okay. follow up. Okay, thanks. Next question, please. Tonight's last question will be from Victor Cordero in Spanish from Australia, Channel 62, Los Angeles. Please hey, Victor. Ahead. Buenas tardes. I'm going to try to be brief. I got three uh, topics. Uh, one of them is on the vaccine, and the other one, the other two are off topic. I'm going to ask them in English and then in Spanish really quick. Number one, uh, let's talk about the vaccines. Why are we not getting enough? Who is responsible for, for supplying it to us? Number two, which is the first one off topic, there's the controversy about our kids going back to school. I believe Joe Buscaino and Gil Tedillo and other politicians are looking after the good of our community, yes, but some parents are just not ready to send their kids back to in-person education. In the past, if a parent didn't send their kids to school, he or she was liable for that. Uh, he would be in trouble. Now, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna force him to, to, to go back to school? And uh, question number three, how are the pandemic regulations on restaurants in our beautiful city of Los Angeles versus uh, street vendors. Some uh, taco stands are working, and you know, it's very logical. They're trying to bring uh, bread to the table, which is great, but some restaurant owners are saying that the competition is unfair, mm. and that's why uh, more than 15,000 small businesses have closed the doors. Si le pregunto al alcalde brevemente, hablemos de las vacunas. ¿Quién es responsable de mandarlos? ¿Por qué no estamos recibiendo demasiadas vacunas? Número dos. Eh, la controversia de las escuelas, algunos políticos de nuestra ciudad, que obviamente están viendo por el bien de nuestra comunidad, quieren regresar a los niños a las escuelas en persona. Sin embargo, algunos padres de familia no están listos para ello, eh, tienen miedo. ¿Y qué va a pasar en el pasado si los padres no mandaban a los niños a la escuela? Se metían en problemas. ¿Ahora qué va a pasar? ¿Los vamos a obligar o qué va a pasar? Y tercero y último, eh, ¿cómo están las regulaciones durante la pandemia para los restaurantes? en comparación con los vendedores ambulantes. Hay gente que vende comida en las calles, es algo muy bueno, están tratando de llevar comida a sus hogares, sin embargo, algunos dueños de restaurante piensan que esto no es justo y por eso se han tenido que cerrar más de 15 mil restaurantes pequeños en nuestra ciudad. Gracias, alcalde, and I'm sorry for asking. No, don't worry. Gracias, Victor. I'll answer in English as I always do, and I'll, I'll also answer in Spanish each one, and then I'll go into my Spanish address right after that, and thank you to everybody. Um, so first, the, with the vaccine, I think I might have already addressed it in English, so let me just go straight to Spanish so that we simply don't have enough. No sé. No sé por qué no tenemos suficiente dosis de la vacuna. Y este es, uno, es un problema. Un problema no solamente por Los Ángeles, pero todas las ciudades y los estados aquí en, en nuestro país. Pero hay ciudades, como por ejemplo en Nueva York, con menos de uh, 20 de la, o 80% de la población del condado de Los Ángeles, ellos están recibiendo uh, uh, 20% más dosis de la vacuna. Uh, por eso, um, una persona en Nueva York tiene la oportunidad um, uh, de 50% más alta uh, para recibir una vacuna de una persona en Los Ángeles. Este no es justo. Necesitamos más atención Y es mi opinión, Los Ángeles uh, debe ser como un estado. Uh, el gobierno federal uh, en Sacramento, uh, no uh, somos un, una ciudad pequeña, um, un condado pequeña. Somos como un estado y necesitamos más vacuna porque la capacidad está aquí. La gente está aquí. El sistema está aquí, el sistema está aquí, pero desafortunadamente las dosis 
uh, no están aquí. Uh, number two, with bring kids back to school. Let me say very clearly, I want our children to be back in school. I want them to be back in school, and I want them to be safe in school. And I want every school worker, including teachers, to be safe as well. We can't have perfection, but if we bring our numbers down, the state has told us that schools can begin to reopen. Your question was, will parents be forced to put their children back in? I don't believe so. I think that's still going to be a hybrid, um, which is what most districts have done. And some parents choose to keep their children at home, but um, so many of our children are falling behind. And I spoke this week with uh, the chair of our school board. I spoke to the heads of our uh, school uh, worker unions, including our teachers union, to offer help to say, as soon as I get a green light, or even today for folks 65 and older, when I can do first doses again, hopefully next week, that I will prioritize those school workers that are already working. Remember, we, even as teachers have been working uh, from home or remotely, um, we've had other school workers who are working on campuses and warehouses for things like food preparation, that they should be a priority. Because I hear that from the district, I hear that from the unions, I hear that from parents. And at least for our elementary school students, that could return as many of them to learning and to a community of care as soon as possible. That should be our number one priority for the next thing we open and the next vaccines we open up. In nuestras escuelas, yo quiero que nuestras, nuestras hijas puedan regresar a sus escuelas. Nuestros niños son el futuro, pero desafortunadamente ahora muchas familias no tienen las opciones, especialmente en las escuelas públicas. Um, y yo quiero ver uh, uh, escuelas abiertas, especialmente a nivel primaria, pero también yo quiero ver escuelas seguras. Por eso yo estoy hablando con los líderes del distrito escolar, incluyendo miembros del, del Fondo de, de, de Educación, uh, los líderes de los sindicatos, los trabajadores, las, los ma maestro, las maestras y los maestros uh, del LAUSD para dar ayuda. Por ejemplo, dosis de la vacuna, cuando nosotros podemos asistirles, yo quiero atraer dosis de este, uh, estos trabajadores, porque nuestros niños deben ser nuestra prioridad. Pero ahora las... Uh, 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 los casos ahora de infección, uh, todos los estadísticos son mejor cada día. Y por eso, probablemente, en uno o dos semanas, distritos y escuelas uh, tendrán la opción para abrir. Pero es mi opinión, las, uh, uh, los padres, las madres que no quieren atraer sus hijos a esta escuela, Debe ser una opción, una opción. Uh, third, with restaurants, um, I'd say, you know, this is an old debate between street vendors and restaurants. There's always a feeling of competition. In fact, many restaurateurs started as street vendors, and I've been a supporter of both. I don't think they have to come uh, one at the expense of the other. We've got the best food trucks in America, and we've got some of the best restaurants in America. Um, and it shouldn't be a competition. That's why we've offered help to both, loans to both, grants to both and working with the county to try to make it cheaper and easier for our street vendors to operate legally so they don't face law enforcement, but also, of course, to support our restaurants. I was very pleased to see our outdoor dining reopen. Uh, that was a good sign for our restaurant workers. And I think, as you know, we've raised millions of dollars to help our restaurant workers bridge that time when either restaurants were closed or hours were reduced. Um, este no es una competición entre los uh, vendedores ambulantes y nuestros restaurantes en nuestros edificios. Um, yo apoyo los dos. Um, por eso nuestros programas de asistencia financiera eh, es no solamente por los restaurantes, pero también por uh, los trabajadores uh, que son partes de los vendedores ambulantes. Y muchas cosas los vendedores ambulantes uh, se hacen. Um, dueños de sus uh, restaurantes en nuestros vecindarios. Um, y por eso el condado uh, debe reducir el costo del negocio por estos um, uh, um, um, negociantes pequeñitas. Y también necesitamos apoyar nuestros restaurantes ahora. Y es mi esperanza que la legislación federal pueda finalmente dar asistencia directamente a nuestros restaurantes porque ellos merecen este, um, y finalmente, durante estos tiempos difíciles, 
um, con millones de dólares privadas. Y, uh, nos, nosotros estamos trayendo estos fondos para los trabajadores en estos restaurantes durante um, uh, diciembre y enero, uh, cuando los, uh, las horas fueron reducidas y no uh, fueron muchas opciones para ellos. Pero uh, estos trabajadores, estos uh, restaurantes son críticos al éxito de esta ciudad, son la, la alma de nuestros vecindarios. With that, I'll turn to our Spanish uh, address. Thank you again to everybody who tuned in. Thank you for your advocacy. And like I said, we will continue a meeting the moment and vaccinating as many people as we get vaccines for. And it is my hope that we will, bearing good news tonight or tomorrow, we'll be back up and running at those sites uh, on Tuesday. And thank you for your patience. Muy buenas tardes, Los Ángeles. Esta tarde quiero enfocarme en los pasos que estamos tomando para vacunar a todos los angelinos y poner un fin a esta pandemia. La ciudad de Los Ángeles ha administrado 293,252 vacunas en nuestros cinco sitios de vacunación. El 98, 98% de la provisión de vacunas que hemos recibido. Esta estadística es, uh, es un nivel más alto en el país. Y en esta semana administramos un promedio de 13,051 vacunas diarias en nuestros sitios, 27% más de la semana pasada. Sin embargo, el problema es que no recibimos suficientes vacunas a tiempo. Mañana, la ciudad habrá acabado su provisión de vacunas moderna para la primera dosis. Esto es un gran obstáculo y en nuestro trabajo para vacunar todos los angelinos. Y desafortunadamente, por eso, tenemos que cerrar el estadio de los Dodgers temporalmente, juntos con nuestros otros sitios no móviles, este viernes y sábado, para personas que necesitan su primera dosis. Cuando recibi recibamos más vacunos, abriremos los sitios de nuevo y tendremos más citas para la primera dosis, probablemente el martes o miércoles. Esto no afecta a personas esperando su segunda dosis. Sé, yo sé que esta noticia es frustrante y comparto su frustración. Hemos hecho nuestra parte para que nuestra infraestructura funcione. Y estoy contento que el condado de Los Ángeles anunció hoy que va a expandir la lista de personas elegibles para recibir la vacuna, incluyendo a trabajadores en los sectores de educación, cuidado de niños, comida y agricultura, y servicios de emergencia y oficiales de la ley en las próximas semanas. Pero necesitamos más vacunas ahora. También estoy contento que nuestros compañeros de nivel estatal y federal están trabajando para abrir más sitios de vacunación, pero no podemos ni debemos esperar. Necesitamos más vacunas ahora en los sitios que están abiertos. Mientras esperamos para más dosis, seguimos ampliando nuestros esfuerzos para asegurar que más personas tengan acceso a una vacuna. La semana pasada lanzamos un programa piloto de vacunación móvil en las comunidades de bajos recursos, en el sur de Los Ángeles, en el este de Los Ángeles, en el noreste de San Fernando en las próximas semanas. En la primera semana administramos más de 1,300 vacunas en el distrito 8, en el sur de Los Ángeles. Entre ellos, el 90% eran personas de color. Y esta tarde puedo anunciar que vamos a duplicar ese número esta semana, lanzando este programa al Distrito 9, en el sur de Downtown, y un tercero equipo móvil la siguiente semana en el Distrito 14, al lado este de la ciudad. Estoy agradecido con mis colegas, los concejales Marquis Harris Dawson, Curran Price y Kevin De León, por su liderazgo en este esfuerzo y a mi equipo de alcance comunitario, quienes están trabajando para asegurar que las vacunas lleguen 
a las personas que más las, uh, las necesitan. Ahora quiero tomar un momento para hablar directamente a aquellos que tienen dudas sobre la vacuna del COVID-19. Decisiones sobre nuestra salud es algo personal. Y yo entiendo las dudas, especialmente en nuestra comunidad afroamericana, en la comunidad inmigrante. Hay un legado de desigualdad en nuestro sistema médico que ha dejado uh, cicatrices para nuestra comunidad afroamericana. Pero necesitamos que nuestras comunidades de color tomen esta vacuna para evitar más sufrimiento. Y es esencial tomar esta vacuna para proteger a su familia y su vida. Estamos haciendo todo lo posible para corregir toda la información errónea que hay. Sabemos que la vacuna es 100% efectiva para evitar hospitalización con COVID-19 y 100% efectivo para prevenir enfermedad grave. La vacuna le ayudará a usted y a su familia y a su comunidad a estar seguros y regresar a un sentido de normalidad. Las vacunas en Los Ángeles fueron desarrolladas por expertos en un proceso transparente. La FDA y una junta de expertos en la seguridad revisaron cada estudio. Lo más importante es, las vacunas salvarán vidas y pondrán un fin a esta pandemia. Eso es lo que pueden hacer las vacunas. Cuando es elegible, por favor, haga una cita para vacunarse. Además de nuestro trabajo luchando contra el COVID-19, seguimos también trabajando para luchar contra la indigencia. Efectivo, inmediatamente, he autorizado el dinero para extender los contratos de renta en varios hoteles de Project Room Key hasta el 30 de diciembre, gracias a los recursos garantizados por el gobierno federal el mes pe pasado. El personal de LASA va a continuar trabajando para encontrar un hogar permanente para 1,200 personas sin hogar quienes están en hoteles ahora. Mañana empezamos alojando a personas en las 300 habitaciones que están vacías y entre ellas la mitad será para personas sin hogar viviendo en Skid Row. Además, seguimos nuestro trabajo para ayudar a que residentes puedan pagar sus fracturas y mantenerse en cuarentena para evitar la propagación de COVID-19. Hoy estoy actualizando mi orden de emergencia para ampliar el suplemento a la póliza de permisos pagados a los empleados que han estado trabajando durante al menos 60 días en grandes empresas o organizaciones sin fines de lucros que tienen más de 500 empleados en la ciudad o más de 2,000 empleados en todo el país. Con esta póliza, los empleados pueden recibir su pago si tienen que quedarse en casa por enfermedad de COVID-19. Y espero que el Congreso pueda re renovar el suplemento a la póliza de permisos pagados para que las familias puedan recibir el alivio que necesitan. Visite wagesla.lacity.org para más información. Después de un año difícil, y con mucho dolor, hay esperanza. Los datos van en la dirección correcta. Los nuevos casos y las hospitalizaciones de coronavirus en el condado de Los Ángeles han bajado en la última semana. Pero seguimos perdiendo demasiada gente. Hoy, el condado de Los Ángeles perdió 141 personas más. Y ayer, California, se convirtió en el estado con el mayor número de fallecidos por COVID-19 del país. Sigan usando la mascarilla, por favor. La CDC recomienda ahora llevar dos mascarillas. Podría evitar más de 95% de los contagios. Y mantenga su distancia y evite las reuniones. 
Recuerda que el aire y la ventilación reducen el riesgo de COVID-19. Los Ángeles hay esperanza en el horizonte. Quédense seguro. Quédense en buena salud y siempre que pueda, quédense en casa. Fuerza y amor. Gracias. Thank you.